Welcome to the Get Real Podcast, your high octane boost of full on reality therapy for personal, business, and investing success with your host, Ron Phillips, because somebody's got to tell it like it is. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Get Real Podcast. Rome, your hosts, we are back. <laughs> we are back. Ron and Heather. <laughs> we are back, everybody. Super happy to be here. We have something so great to talk about today and uh, came in by request, which I yeah. love. You know, in addition to that, we just have a whole bunch of people, you know. I'm not sure why, Heather, we have an inordinate amount of people who are um, uneasy and not really uneasy about the market. They're uneasy about certain aspects of investing, this being one of them, um, recently which is a bit strange. We don't usually have people who are that nervous. Uh, yeah. We do. So this comes not only as a request, but also, I guess, in response to all of the people who have many questions. And we'll probably do a couple more episodes on certain pieces like that, because if the people we're talking to have questions, surely some of you out there have questions too. Yeah, exactly. So send them in to us. We actually really love knowing that we're speaking to topics that you want to hear about versus us assuming that you want to hear about it. So because otherwise you just get to hear what we want to talk. Yeah, about. That's right. Which is perfectly fine too. Cause we like doing that. We do. I, amazingly. I mean, I still, I still laugh considering the first time we talked about doing this, I was like, that sounds awful. Like what? <laughs> Why would anyone want to do that? Now I kind of uh, look forward to it. It's so funny. I seriously want to do, I want to do a sports one. So that I can talk smack. I really don't know enough to do one, but I think that would make it more more humorous. Yes. Exactly. I get a whole bunch of people out there like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> it doesn't stop me from having opinions, people. That's right. So the question that we had from a client is about how to vet a property manager, how to know that they're a good property manager. And I think that this question we've never talked about in detail. I We've talked about it. Um, I think we talked about it, but it was a long time ago. Yeah, that's true. Like and years ago. And maybe not as deep of a dive too, because we've talked right. about it in a lot of our master classes, um, mm -hmm. things, to, things that you want from a property manager, et cetera. But um, what's kind of fun is we developed a checklist for interviewing a new property manager for our properties, for our clients. Because um, I, I guess to take a step in that direction for a second, we do not manage properties. Thank heaven. Thank just right. God. Yes. <laughs> so we have uh, property managers in all the markets where we sell property that we vet and they do a great job. I had a call with one of them just yesterday, actually. And I just thanked them for taking such good care of our people. Because... When you don't get any calls, oh, it's beautiful. Heather, this is a great time to also bring up. We have had a rash of people. So there must be have, there's like two or three like coaching programs out there about how to be your own landlord, oh. which, you know, I mean, if you want to be your own landlord, you definitely should go and, you know, get some help for sure. I just don't know why the hell you would want to do that. <laughs> yes. I mean, let's think through it just for a second. I mean, just for giggles, let's just think through this. Typically, when we talk to people and we ask them why, you know, we go through this why exercise and we we ask them, why are they doing like, why do you want to invest in real estate other than to make money? Clearly, yeah. you want to make money. They always said to have more time. Yeah. I mean, without yeah. fail, everybody says they want to have more time. So my question to every sane human being out there is... If time is what you're after, why in the hell would you want to learn how to be your own landlord so that you have to work harder? That means like literally during your work day or after work or on the weekends, you have to do everything that the property management company would be doing, yes. including chase people down for your rent and re release your place. All of these different things. Why, why, why would you want to do that? So I actually have a real example on this. It was really interesting. I met with a husband and wife and they self-manage 
And so meaning that they they collect the rent, they handle the repairs, crazy. right? We love you though, still. <laughs> a little crazy. But Ron, it was fascinating because they were doing a 1031 exchange and I was showing them different options for property. And th- at the beginning of the call, they both said they were tired of self-managing. And the idea of owning remotely and hiring a property manager was a relief for them. But fascinating that in the middle of picking property, they had selected property, we were moving forward, and then they started sending me property and saying, well, we could just, I mean, couldn't we just manage this one like closer to us? And and I I, I had to yeah, remind them twice. Yeah. yeah, I had to remind them twice. Like, do you remember that you told me that you didn't want to manage these? I had to remind them. And every time they went, oh, yeah, that's true. We really don't want to do that. But they yeah. they really were like stuck on that, you know? I'm, and you know? listen... And that's why that's why we 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 respectfully say on the program that there is a twelve step program for people because we should develop the twelve step program, Ron. We should the first step, guys, is to admit you have a problem. Those folks <laughs> have passed step one; they've admitted they have a problem. That doesn't mean that you may not reoffend. It's just not what that means, right? It's, yeah, true. You have a moment of admit. weakness. <laughs> Bam, and you're going to want to be right back in there, swinging the hammer. I, yeah. I don't know. I've never had this problem. And, you know, it maybe it's a gene thing. It's a genetic thing. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think I, I think it's been proven now that, you know, other addictions can be, you know, gene specific. <laughs> yeah, true. If there's a gene for people <laughs> to have to manage their I've completely derailed us again. <laughs> this is fantastic. I'm loving I've it. Completely derailed Hired us again. Ron. I seriously up. do not understand this phenomenon. <laughs> and and this is this hasn't happened in the past. We've been uh, listen. I've been at this since two thousand five. It's only like within the last year. Yeah, you but, know why I think it is, Ron, is that interest rates are up and so cash flows down. So people say, "Oh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna increase my cash flow by just managing this myself." We yeah, but where did these coaching companies come? And here, yeah, no, really. like, I the whoever it is that is selling these coaching programs about how to be a landlord, they must be an epic salesperson because I can't think of a, I can't think of a harder sale than to try to sell somebody into being their own landlord. I literally can't. Just think, insurance, too. <laughs> people hate insurance salesmen. I can't think of another thing worse. I mean, I would, I would much rather sell insurance and try to sell people I'm into dying. being the person who everyone literally if you ask somebody about real, real estate, rental properties, and they have a negative story, it is because they yeah, self-manage. That's true. All, every single one of them. That's so true. I just, I have to ask, is there a worse sale? Yeah. That's I don't know. Point. Funeral stuff? I mean. Maybe. Ron, you too could take calls in the middle of the night. You too could do this. Let me teach you how. <laughs> teach you. Turn your, your phone right now is set to off. <laughs> What you do is you switch it on <laughs> so that it rings at two in the morning when, it's you know, your, your, scenario. your tenants stopped, stopped up their own toilets and yeah. you are the recipient of the phone call. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why anyone would want to do that. In a perfect world, this could be you. We probably I, should talk about property management companies now <laughs> and stop, but I, I literally could go on for the entire <laughs> show about how horrible of an idea this is. Yeah, it is. I agree. And you're right. A lot of the horror stories are... The, like when I asked the question, like, oh, you managed it yourself? Well, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, now, I should say a little caveat before we jump. What? There's a lot of people in areas where, you know, the, you know, like California, where there just straight up isn't enough money to pay a management company. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. They, you know, uh, we've had plenty of clients who've gotten into rental properties out there. They've done really, really well equity wise, horrible cash, flow, like no cash flow. Yeah. Negative cash flow, actually. And if they hired a property management company, it would be even worse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a little different than seeking out. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm done now. That's enough. All right. So I'm going to start going over these questions. We have 12 questions. So you guys, there's not a million, but there's 12. It's like lightning round for property management. That's true. That's true. Mm. So how many units do you manage is the first question we ask. Important to know. What is the right question, Heather? Or what's the right answer, Heather? 
Well, you don't want too few because that means they're really young and probably don't have systems in place and probably don't have um, enough uh, infrastructure, basically. So they're not going to have a way for them to handle repairs that's systematized. So a lot more problem problematic. Um, so I would say we've worked with some that are pretty new, though. I mean, we've worked with some that are under 50 units, but that's the exception. And that's because we need one badly and we're training one up, right? Yep. But I would say most of our property managers manage probably 300 doors. It would be my assumption yep. without pulling the number. Yeah. Yes. Or more. Sorry. Um, how long have you been in business? What do you think the right answer for that one is, Ron? That's oh, yeah. One. But more than more than two years is the best yeah. answer. Most businesses of any nature fail in the first year. So got to make it at least past a year. Um, because otherwise you don't know how to run a business like at all, yes. any kind of business. Yes. So how long have you been in business? Got to be at least that. And then two years means we made it past the first year and hopefully made it past some growing pains. Because if you've been in business for two years and you have 300 units, now the problem that you have is growth. And yeah. can you even, can you handle it? And do you have the money to be able to handle it? Yeah, that's true. And those are a lot of questions that come out of that question. Um, because the thing about property management that most people don't understand, and I've explained this just actually internally to our team in the last couple of weeks, um, is they are needing to hire as they grow, but sometimes there's not the money there in the budget to hire someone until they've grown just a little bit more. And so you're in this awkward stretch moment where you're needing a little bit more revenue, so meaning you need to take on some more property. Thank you. 13 year old girl, <laughs> this really awkward, yes. you know, 14 or 15 year old boys. It's that kind of awkward, except for, you know, imagine that except for out on their own and still need money. Yes. And then, and then you've got a picture of what that looks like. That is so funny. Yes. Cause I have a 13 year old girl. That's what made me laugh. Um, yes. That's a very good point. Um, what types of properties they manage and how many of each is the third question. So do you manage all commercial? I mean, this happened pretty recently. They managed almost all commercial and were wanting to take on some single family. And that's just good information to have, right? Like yeah, what type it, of commercial is it? And <laughs> managing multifamily is entirely different than managing yeah. single family. Yeah. So if they have, you know, 1500 units um, and they have like 10 or 15 houses, well, all of the attention is going to be paid to the, what is that? 1,490 units, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're the ones who are going to get all the attention. Right? Yep. So anyway. Yeah. Good. It's a good, good question. Good information to have. And sometimes it just helps, even if we move forward with them, it just helps us to know where they're at and offer some, like, like what you just said, Ron, like, well, how are we going to protect against the commercial and having all the attention, stuff like that. Right. Um, oh, and, and also I would say it depends on how many properties we're intending to send them. The, the one I'm thinking of that managed mostly commercial, we had about 25 or 30 houses that were ready for them to manage right then. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't as, yeah, it wasn't like I was introducing the first one, one at a time. So, um, okay. Fourth question. Do you have an in-house maintenance team? In-house usually saves the owner some money versus outsourcing everything. Usually. But yeah. that that question is down a little further um, when it gets to fees, you know, yeah. because usually it is. It doesn't always make mean that it is. Because sometimes yep. it can be a massive profit center for... Yeah. Uh, I mean, it should be a profit center. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they shouldn't make money on, on maintenance. I'm just saying it shouldn't be a massive profit center because that puts you at odds with the property management company. Yep. Exactly. Um, number five, what management software do you use? So working with a property manager that I've had, I've had a couple clients bring this up, not any of our property managers, but oh yeah, they just send me like an Excel spreadsheet every month <laughs> or they, they send me like a, a statement that they've created, right? Like in on so, Word or something. This is like um, business 101, right? So again, how many years have you been in business? And if you've been in business longer than a year or two years and you don't have any books, there's a big, big, big yeah. problem. Yep. Um, 
So Excel is not, that's not a property management software. Correct. And it's good to know that like Appfolio, you can't, you can't use Appfolio from what property managers have told me. So this is coming from them. Unless you have at least, I think it was at least a hundred doors um, is kind of well, intro I mean, you level. You can't afford it. It's, it's, it's not yeah. made for yeah, not sorry, for not made mall operators. Yes. Like if you if you own forty of your own doors and you're psychotic and want to manage them yourself, um, you could go get Appfolio, but it's just it's just not going to be very yeah. Uh, it's not logical because it costs too much money. Yeah, it's literally for a property management business. It's not for uh, a single operator. But knowing that they use Appfolio, for example, right, is like oh well, you have. You haven't like it's kind of substantiating how many doors they have and things like that. Yeah. To know Appfolio is being used. Appfolio is probably my favorite of all it's, of them. It's the biggest. And then, you know, there's there's several other ones that I mean, I guess we could run through them really quick. But yeah. I mean, if if you if they say any of these, they actually have real software. Right. There's a there's rent manager, there's property where there's rent vine. Um build missing any other big one, buildium. I'm missing, uh, I'm missing one other one, though, and I can't think of what it is. Um, the other I one's mean, not very are, good, though. Those are actually good yeah. softwares that if somebody has those, you can go, okay, yeah, th- these guys are running a legit business. That doesn't mean there's not other ones. There, there are smaller companies that are always trying to get into the, into the business. But those are the major players, which yeah. most uh, companies have. If they say QuickBooks, run. That's not yeah. a property management software. Yes. Solid, solid point. Um, okay, next one, number six, what MSAs do you manage? Uh, sorry, what areas in the MSA? So MSA is Met- Metropolitan Statistical Area. I it don't is. know what all my acronyms mean. Yes. Um, but what areas in that larger area do you manage? So for example, I had a conversation yesterday with a property manager in Oklahoma City. And I said, so these particular parts of Oklahoma City, these specific suburbs and he said, yeah, we, that's too far out for us. Like if, if you sent us, you know, 20 properties in that location, then we could take that on. And that's really just travel time distance, but it's also um, having their vendors and their, you know, in-house ma- maintenance team being able to go and drive that far, like, you know, 45 usually, minutes. And usually it's a hire, right? Usually they'll have a manager yeah. that would be over that region of the, of the MSA. So to them, they got to, they got to run the numbers. And then, so yeah. if somebody says that that's a, that's a, that's something that says, okay, well, these guys, they know what they're doing yeah, and they're not willing to go over here just for some business because these guys have been in the business long enough. That they know this is going to cost me money too. And that yeah. there's a break even point. If we can get past the break even point, love to <clears throat> love to yeah. expand, but I can't do it for less than this because I'm just going to lose money. Yes. I, I I love that manager. Yeah. Um, but they still you still shouldn't beg them to manage your property because it's going to be ineffective. And that's, and a smart one will just tell you no. So. Yeah, and if they try to tell you no and you beg, and then later on say, "Man, why haven't you gone by my property to ensure that these tenants didn't do damage?" You you can they'll probably remind you. <laughs> Remember how we told you this is far out for us. We don't have someone regularly in that area, right? So. You want someone that wants to be in that location, um, not forcing it. Um, do you, a, a follow-up question for that is any specific criteria on neighborhood um, that they have, which is also really good to know. A, a good property manager is going to say, yeah, we won't manage these types of properties in these types of neighborhoods um, because they, again, experience, right? Yes. Yeah. So. And if you bought properties that are in those types of neighborhoods, there's typically management companies that's that specialize in yeah. that area, right? So if you bought in a war zone, there's management companies typically in every MSA that specialize in that product. And that is who you want. Yes. You do not want to hire a, a, a class A person to manage in a class D neighborhood. It will not work out well and vice versa. Yeah, exactly. They don't advertise in the same places. They don't fish in the same ponds. It's just not... It's not good to hire the person who's, you know, managing in a specific area to manage in another area, unless they have managers that, they, that they've hired over this sector and then this sector over here, and they're completely different. That's okay. That works. Yep. Um, question number seven, we're making it through these pretty fast. 
Um, what is your fee structure? Man, fee structures can get, I mean, some of them are pretty complex. Mm -hmm. So understanding what they're charging for, um, cause there's, there's the overall percentage of the rent, right? That fee that they charge, but then there's ancillary fees. They charge when the property is vacant to lease it up for the, for the first time, the lease up fee. Then if the tenant decides to renew their lease for another year, there's a renewal fee. Um, yep. You can have override on maintenance, um, uh, like pet fees, like how, who, who gets the pet fee or who gets late fees. If they have a late fee, does the property manager keep the late fee? And a lot of them are doing that now or like NSF fees. So if they bounce check bounces, who keeps that fee? There's just a lot of a lot of fees and to understand exactly how they're handled is important. Do you know, I don't know if you'd have yep. anything to add there? Okay. I, I really um, don't. I mean, that's it, it is what it is. And you guys, when you, yeah. when you get them, uh make sure you ask the follow-up questions. Because some people just say, Well, our, our fee is six percent. Well, that's really, really low. But then yeah. they, they have to be making money somewhere else. So just ask the follow-up questions. So yep. Exactly. Um, and the maintenance override is typically 10%. So if you get a bill for a thousand dollars, it's 1100 that comes to you, right? Cause they, mm -hmm. they, and that fee, a lot of people beat up the property manager on that. But as I've worked with property managers over the years, I feel like it is earned, um, sometimes more than others, right? Of course, as with anything, but they will coordinate, they'll find the vendor to go out there. They'll coordinate and sometimes meet the vendor on site and then stay there sometimes while the vendor's doing the work. And then um, like all of that is time travel. They have to pay their people for it. And the same goes for marketing the property for rent. That they're sometimes incurring marketing expenses that you don't see. They're paying to place ads or things like that. Yeah, and they then they the bonus. Property, you yeah. know, however many yeah. times. Usually the people who are showing the property are paid on a commission. Yeah. So that fee goes to pay them. The majority of it goes to pay them. Yeah. Um, so all these fees are earned and um, you just need to be, just be careful, you know, um, the pet deposit and the pet one make, that one absolutely makes no sense to me that a property management company would hold either one of those. Yeah. And yet they do in certain instances. And so, yeah. I mean, though, both of those fees, like I understand, I can understand the late fee. I, I actually can understand that one, right? Sometimes they'll split it 50%. Some of them, they just keep it. But that's because there's a lot of work in chasing down that money. So I, I can understand that one. Yeah. There's no work involved in if the dog or the cat tears up the property. That's what the pet, that's what the fee's for. And then the extra monthly fee for that is also for that. So yeah. it has nothing to do with the property management company. So if they're, that's a, that's a hard turnoff for me if they're keeping yes. pet fees. I agree. That, that just means that there's a whole bunch of other ways they're going to bend you over too. Yep. And sometimes it's worth to, worth it to say, well, instead of six, can I pay 8% and reduce these other fees? I mean, sometimes you just can run the numbers and determine. Um, our typical is to do 50% lease up and a flat rate, like 250, 350 um, for that renewal fee. And sometimes it's really hard for them to stomach that. I had a call with a property manager this week in another area um, and they were really fighting for their 100% lease up fee, Ron. And I, I was like saying, look, nobody else charges that. And she said, here's the thing, Heather. And she explained that they had shown this house 68 times or something so far in like a matter of a couple of weeks. So high, very high interest. Right. But she said that they are meeting every person. And we are going out there for every showing where I talked to another property manager in that same city. And they said to me, Heather, we need house, a house number that was new construction. The house number hasn't been put on this house, Heather. And that's a problem because the tenants, we just give them a code and they go out and see the property. They do a self showing. They go out and show it themselves. No one meets them there. And so those are just questions to ask, right? I mean, if you're going to charge a higher lease up fee, and they, she said, it's worth it, Heather. We place really good tenants. They stay longer. They take better care of the house. We meet them face to face. And before we'll let, you know, they'll approve their application. And I was like, solid point. I like that. So anyway, I was a bit of a sidetrack, but I think an important note. Um, okay, next question. 
How do you market vacant properties? We've covered that a little bit, actually, right there. Um, I don't know. Did we miss anything, Ron? No, just listen to the story and see if it makes sense. And if they're not using Facebook Marketplace, I mean, there's something wrong. Yeah, true. That's a good point. Um, What is your current vacancy rate? How many of your houses are currently vacant? And man, I find that it should be under 5%. Wouldn't you say, Ron? Yeah, depending on the market. And then the other thing is um, in that specific area. So if you're in a a metropolitan area, right, an MSA, um, like Kansas City, for instance, and the property management company manages in the whole city, Mm -hmm. it's important to understand what the vacancy rate is where you're buying. Yeah, true. Because it can be wildly different than the whole city. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right, we're on question 10. We're getting close. Um, What is your average timeline for tenant turns? Um, This is a big one. Yeah, it's so good. Because <laughs> I, um, I think you can have, I, I have, we have one property manager I know that we don't work with anymore. And that was one of the reasons the tenant turn time was forever. I mean, tenant turn is when a tenant moved, the time between a tenant moving out and the, until it's ready to market. And then, um, of course, then leased up ideally. But does it take you 30, 60 days to put it back on the market again? <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's a lot and of time. The, the best case scenario. So I've got these managers. I wish I could, I wish I could take these guys and like duplicate them and run them all over the place in the whole country. But these guys up in, in this little town in South Carolina, where I own some um, duplexes. These guys are on it. They know when the, the tenants is the, when the lease is coming up, they, they talk to the, to the uh, tenant um, and they talk to them probably, you know, 30 or 45 days before they mm-hmm. find out whether they're going to be leaving. And then we have a conversation about what we want to do if they're leaving. Are we renovating the unit? Or are we putting, are we just going to, you know, clean it up and put it back on the market? What's the difference in the rents? All, all of this communication happens before it's, and then mm-hmm. the, the cool thing is if they're moving out, we've got the work line. We know exactly what we're doing inside the unit. We have the work lined up and those guys are done and they've already been leasing. Um, they've already had it out for lease while the work's being done. Wow. So that's a awesome. lot of times we're leased up within a week. I mean, it's, it's absolutely completely different than other places where I have properties. And I, I literally wish I could clone these guys and move them. Um, and when we, when we, first initially interviewed them they didn't even really work in this area too much it was kind of one of those things how they're like we were talking about earlier where well i mean if there's 24 units yeah we'll you know we'll go out there and then they did a a market uh, study for us told us what they thought rents were and then we just been steadily increasing the rents because you know if they'll if it rents in a week then we're too well so we'll just exactly. increase it a little bit. And then on the next unit, we'll increase a little bit. We've just been kind of inching the rents up. They've been invaluable partners. That's awesome. Um, they're just so good. And so that's how it's supposed to work. Most of the time, it doesn't work like that. Most of the time, it works like something like, well, yeah, hey, your tenant moved out. Um, and we need to turn it. And you lose a week somewhere in there with mm-hmm. you know them figuring out that, I, I don't know how they didn't know, but like, you know, and, and that's, again, we've had uh, other podcast episodes where we talked about the, the owner's responsibility is to also know when the lease is coming due so that you can contact your yeah. management company, right? So it's not all on them. Um, but usually, like sometimes you'll lose two, three weeks, which is unacceptable. And that's what this question is for. How do you handle tenant terms? Of how long does it take? Um, if they've got their own maintenance people and their own crews and stuff, it shouldn't take very long. They should be able to get in there and get done and, and get out. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Really, really good question. I like that, Ron, that you gave the, in ideal circumstances, this is extraordinary to have it be like a week, right? So that way you have an idea. I would say um, that that's my fastest too. I've had uh, tenants move out where they didn't even have to clean the carpets. And so it, it was like 48 hours or less. No, you, um, love the, you love Oh, yeah. People. Love yeah. that. <laughs> like, where are you moving? Are you moving up? Can I buy you a house? I want to, <laughs> I want to rent you again. Where are you moving yes, to? Exactly. Uh, um, so the next one, the next two are pretty basic ones. So we've rounded out the most important top 10. But 
Um, a sample management agreement. So like uh, just a blank one to review is what we always request. That way, if we missed anything in the fee structure or whatever, we can catch it in the management agreement. Um, a couple things we look for in the management agreement. I'm trying to think what it's called, Ron, but the um, the mi- the minimum, uh, the, the amount, it's usually $500 that they don't have to call the owner for making any repairs. So I can't think of what that's called. But that number, like looking for their temp, their sample of how they like to handle handle management. And then last is just who's my point of contact. So who am I going to talk to? Who's going to be the person that I reach out to? Because usually the person you're talking to as a new client is going to be different than the person who's managing your property. Mm-hmm. So that those are the top 12 questions. And a um, little, little tip. If you have a really good property management company, they'll try to they'll try to talk your tenants out of moving. Yeah. That's a good point. All right. Some really awesome property management companies have a letter that goes out that reminds people just how much of a pain in the butt it is to move <laughs> and how much it costs. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it's pretty cool when they when they do stuff like that. Um because sometimes they'll stay. And sometimes when, when they have like an exit interview that, that asks them why they're moving, sometimes they'll say something that the, that the management company was just unaware of. Like, well, we've been here for like six years and the carpets are horrible. And, you know, where's, when they can just say, because they know as soon as these people move out, we're going to renovate the unit anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, well, what if we replace the, Carpet, would you stay for an increase in rent? Sometimes they will. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, so a really on the ball management company, which I'm going to have to just admit, there aren't very many of these. (laughs) Yeah. I, of all of the properties I've ever owned, I've only experienced this two times. One is this place up in South Carolina, which, gosh, I mean, if I could buy more property up there, I would. Um, uh, it's so, and currently that's the only one that I have that's that good. Wow. Um, and then I, you know what, I, I'll tell you guys, I have some that are kind of, kind of marginal and I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to not have them anymore, but in the area, they're the best of the best, of the, worst. <laughs> best, of, the, best of the marginal. <laughs> right. So what that means is that I have to be a little more active than I would like to be, but yeah. I don't have to be self-managed, which is fantastic. I just have to direct the work a little bit more than I would normally do. That's all. That's right. Winning right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's remember there's a 12 step program for you folks. We can help you. We can help you. And if you're, if you're like really kicking around the idea of paying somebody to learn how to do that, I would just strongly encourage you to not do that. Yep, exactly. Good property managers are worth their weight in gold and they're there. They're out there. So. Yes. Yes. Okay. So hopefully that helps you guys. Um, and until next week. Well, I shouldn't say something because, you know, inside of the something means that you could go out there and actually buy one of these stupid programs. So everything other than that is included in this. <laughs> get out there and make something happen. This has been the Get Real Podcast. To subscribe and for more information, including a list of all episodes, go to getrealestatesuccess.com.